Okay, I've got uh, 5.30, so I want to go ahead and welcome everyone to the Sonoma Valley Groundwater Sustainability Agency community meeting. And uh, hopefully you see that on your screen. And if uh, this isn't where you intended to be, then um, you're not at the right meeting. But uh, my name's uh, Tim Parker, and I'm going to facilitate the meeting um, today. And I want to welcome you all. Um, for today's community meeting, there will be opening remarks uh, and welcome, two presentations followed by a question and answer sessions, small group breakout sessions, uh, followed by a brief meeting wrap up. Uh, please note that mute and unmute functions will be disabled during the meeting. Meeting attendee input will be attained through the chat function in Zoom and by raising your hand during the Q&A session after each presentation. The chat function should be visible on the menu bar at the screen bottom. If it's not visible, click more. The raise hand function on the other hand is in the participants panel also listed at the bottom of the menu. Uh, the raise hand is next to your, uh, is, is, uh, is next to your name typically, or it could be down at the bottom. Um, and uh, these uh, windows can pop out if you, uh, if you uh, desire to do that. We we'll encourage you to post any questions or comments in chat you may have even during the presentations. When your uh, raised hand is selected, your mic will be turned on and your question or comment will be taken. Otherwise, your mic will be muted. Meeting attendee input will also be obtained during some small group breakout session when everyone attending will have a chance to talk and answer some of our key questions and provide input. The breakout sessions, you'll automatically be placed into breakout sessions uh, when we get to that point. And what will happen is a window will pop up asking you to join a breakout session. So please quick, uh, click the window and, um, and um, uh, join the breakout session. After the breakout sessions, we'll provide a short meeting wrap up and receive brief summary of input from each small group facilitator. Finally, uh, your, your input's very valuable and important to the GSP development process and will be passed along to the Sonoma Valley Groundwater Sustainability Agency Board, the advisory committee and staff for consideration and preparation of the GSP for Sonoma Valley. Um, I'll go ahead and cut and paste these uh, instructions regarding the chat into the um, uh, uh, chat function so everybody can see those. And then uh, with that, I'd like to go ahead and uh, welcome everybody. Um, and uh, invite uh, Susan Gorn, uh, the uh, board member for the Sonoma Valley Groundwater Sustainability Agency to have a few uh, opening comments, if you would, Susan. Thanks, Tim. And thanks everybody for taking some time out of your busy schedule this evening uh, to participate in a workshop uh, talking about groundwater in Sonoma Valley. We're excited that uh, Tim is going to facilitate a, the good discussion. As you know, we've been working together to really emphasize how important groundwater is and to do an analysis of where groundwater is, has been, and hopefully will be going. And this workshop is vitally important so that you can lend your voice to answer a number of questions that Tim will pose to us in the breakout sessions. Really need to thank Anne Dubay, our administrator, and of course, Tim for facilitating the workshop tonight. And I hope that you find it informative and helpful and setting a very positive direction about where we're going in the future. So thanks, Tim, take it away. Great, thanks, Susan. And with that, I'm gonna hand it off to uh, Marcus Trotta, uh, principal hydrogeologist for Sonoma Water, who's gonna give us an overview on what we know and perhaps some of what we know don't know about the groundwater subbasin. 
So uh, with that, Marcus, uh, go ahead and I'll advance your slides for you. Just tell me when you're ready. Great. Thanks, Tim. Can you hear me? Yes. Coming through loud and clear. All right. Perfect. Well, welcome, everybody, and thank you for attending, and thanks for the uh, introduction. As Tim mentioned, I'm a hydrogeologist with uh, Sonoma Water, um, working um, as staff to the Groundwater Sustainability Agency, and uh, my main role is the preparation of these Groundwater Sustainability Plans, or, or GSPs, and I'm going to give you a, a kind of snapshot of, of where we are in preparation of those plans, which are, are due in uh, January of 2022. So I'll get going here. Um, if you uh, live in uh, on the Sonoma Valley floor from about uh, a couple of miles south of Kenwood down to uh, the uh, San Pablo Bay, you live in the Sonoma Valley groundwater basin. And, and, and Marcus, I want today. that photo. I want that photo. Send me that photo. Boy, is that gorgeous. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it is a beautiful valley, that uh, beautiful groundwater basin to work in, that's for sure. Um, so the purpose of our presentation today is to briefly describe uh, this new law that requires Californians to manage their groundwater, describe features of the basin uh, that we live in, including its uh, geology and groundwater features, this information is going to provide a foundation for understanding how our basin must comply with this new law. The basin is uh, defined by the state of California Department of Water Resources based on uh, geological and other characteristics like rivers and, and city boundaries. And uh, there we go. Uh, the Sonoma Valley Basin includes uh, the valley floor um, and is bordered by Sonoma Mountain. Um, to the west and the Mayakama Mountains to the east. Um, in Sonoma County, there's a total of 14 state designated groundwater basins and subbasins. Only three of those must, uh, must currently comply with the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act or SIGMA. And uh, those include uh, the ones shown here, which is Sonoma Valley, Petaluma Valley, and the Santa Rosa Plain groundwater basins. So Sonoma Valley, Petaluma Valley, and uh, Santa Rosa Plain are all complying with SIGMA by having created groundwater sustainability agencies or, or GSAs, which are governed by boards of directors comprised primarily of, uh, of elected officials. The GSA boards receive input um, from diverse stakeholder-based advisory committees. So we have three advisory committees and, and three groundwater sustainability agencies or GSAs in the county, one covering each of those three basins that I described. Uh, those three basins are now working on the second step of compliance, which is to develop these groundwater sustainability plans or GSPs um, due January 31st, 2022. These plans explain the basin conditions, identify problems or potential problems with groundwater, and will outline projects and actions that can be taken to correct any of those problems. Sonoma County GSAs are independent agencies, but coordinate closely with local cities and the county to leverage resources and promote efficiencies. The goal of SIGMA and the plans are to ensure that groundwater is available today and into the future for all users, including rural residents, farmers, businesses, and the environment. To date, uh, draft sections one and two of the plan have been completed. And most of section three is complete. In 2020, the GSA will be working to finish sections three and four. And the full final draft of the, of the GSP is planned to be released in the fall of 2021. This presentation highlights information that is provided in detail in the draft first three sections of that plan. Uh, these sections describe the basin and groundwater conditions and our presentation is really gonna cover only the key findings from that plan, um, full details and, and access to all the, the draft figures that we're showing here today can be found by following that, that web link that's on this slide, sonomavalleygroundwater.org, where we have the draft sections of the, of the GSPs that have been developed to date posted for, for review. 
So the Sonoma Valley Basin um, itself is approximately 44,000 acres in size. And in this figure, uh, the basin area is shown, um, the boundaries are shown by the dashed blue line. And the uh, entire watershed that contributes to the basin is outlined in the brownish color there. The Sonoma Creek uh, watershed is, is also shown on the plan. But the GSA's uh, jurisdiction and authorities are solely limited to the uh, Sonoma Valley subbasin, which is the area that's within the dashed blue lines. So main communities within the subbasin include the city of Sonoma, El Dorado, Boys Hot Springs, uh, and Glen Ellen. Um, also includes multiple parks and, and open space lands. The basin is a, is a blend of uh, urban areas, rural groundwater users, agricultural and uh, natural lands. So looking in at, at these areas within the, the Blue Basin boundary, uh, much of the land is used for, for irrigated agriculture, uh, shown in the gold colors. Uh, another major land use is uh, residential. Um, we have some urban areas in the city, as well as uh, many rural residential areas shown in the, in the browner and grayish colors. Um, analysis of uh, kind of land use maps from different time periods uh, shows that uh, between about 1974 to 2012, um, irrigated agriculture increased in the basin from about representing about 14% of the land area to, to closer to about 23% in, uh, in more recent years. And uh, the combined residential, commercial, and industrial uses also increased during, increased during that time frame to represent um, uh, going from about 8% to about 13% of the total land area. Uh, native vegetation, which is shown in the uh, palest green color, uh, decreased from 54% of the, the total area in 1974 to about 38% in 1993. And then it increased again uh, to 43% in 2012, uh, mostly owing to the restoration of tidal marshlands in southern Sonoma Valley that has replaced some non-irrigated agriculture shown in darker green in those areas. So much of the agricultural land is, is currently uh, planted in vines, uh, shown in the pink areas, and hay fields, which are shown in the bright yellows. Sonoma Creek and the, and the uh, San Pablo Bay uh, tidal marshlands that, that border the, uh, the basin are kind of some of the more defining water features of Sonoma Valley. People in the basin rely on, on uh, People in the basin rely primarily on four um, primary water sources, including groundwater, uh, surface water, which is uh, imported into the basin from the Russian River, some local surface water supplies, and recycled water. Both the city of Sonoma and the Valley of the Moon Water District, uh, which is shown in peach and the city being shown in blue, rely on a combination of Russian River water and groundwater. Recycled water, shown in purple, is treated to tertiary standards by wastewater treatment plants and used for crop irrigation and landscape irrigation instead of groundwater or imported water. The reliance on groundwater is also illustrated in this pie chart, which shows that about two thirds of all water demands in the basin and contributing watershed area rely on groundwater. About one quarter of water demands in the basin and watershed are met by imported Russian River water 10% by local surface water, and about 10% by recycled water. The next map uh, shows the monitoring wells that measure conditions in the basin. Uh, monitoring wells essentially represent our, our eyes in the ground uh, for, for observing groundwater. Um, with so many people and farmers and the environment relying on groundwater, it's important to understand the health of our groundwater system. Because we can't physically see what's happening underground, we use monitoring wells as our eyes. By checking water levels in these wells over time, a picture begins to emerge of our basin. Thanks to a robust network of volunteers plus municipal water suppliers, mutual water companies, and others, there's about 150 wells in the basin that have been monitored at least twice a year, typically in the spring and the fall, and a smaller subset of wells uh, which are monitored more frequently. While there are still uh, many data gaps, particularly along the, uh, the southern margins of the basin near the Baylands, 
thanks to this monitoring network, the GSA does have data that can allow it to, to track groundwater levels over time and also look back historically in some areas. So what is the groundwater picture in the Sonoma Valley Basin? Section three of the plan provides a, an in-depth look. This presentation will focus on the following areas of section three, the hydrogeologic conceptual model and current and historical groundwater conditions. The hydrogeologic conceptual model simply characterizes the physical processes that control the distribution, occurrence, and movement of the surface water and groundwater systems in the basin, including regional weather, hydrology, geology, water quality, and the principal aquifers that make up the basin. Uh, starting with the, uh, with the weather, um, about half of the sub-basin's rainfall typically comes in a few large storms. We live in a Mediterranean climate with about 90% of the annual rainfall occurring from November through April, and nearly half of that coming in a few large atmospheric rivers. Average annual precipitation at Sonoma has been variable and averaged about 28.8 inches during the 63 year period from 1953 through 2016, with about 12 of the last 15 years seeing some below average rainfall at an average closer to 25 inches per year including uh, the most recent uh, state-defined drought centered around 2014. While the average annual rainfall in the basin itself ranges from 22 to 32 inches annually, shown in the brown and yellow shades, the larger watershed outside the, uh, the, the blue line of the basin has even higher average rainfall, which helps contribute water to our groundwater basin. Uh, getting, uh, getting down into uh, closer into the basin, starting with the soil, um, we have about 17 different soil types in the basin. The type of soil in an area can define how quickly water infiltrates from the surface into the aquifer. Gravelly and sandy soils like those found in the low hills in the southwestern and western areas of the basin allow for more infiltration than the clayey soils that are found throughout much of the, uh, the valley floor. This next figure um, shows the distribution of, of hydraulic connectivity, which is a way that uh, soil scientists measure how rapidly water can infiltrate into the ground and is an indicator of what areas might be better for, for recharge than others. This map, um, which shows the hydraulic connectivity of the basin, illustrates that connectivity in, in most of the basin and the golds and oranges is, is relatively low. Um, between about one and a half inches, so less than, less than half a foot per day. While those areas near lower Sonoma Creek and yellow will have a higher conductivity. And the highest that we see is in the green areas in the north end of the basin and in some of the, uh, the western hills, which ranges between four to 12 feet per day. There's also higher conductivity in much of the northern areas outside of the basin where soils are, thin, are thinner within the contributing watershed. So the basin's geology is a, a very important um, uh, parameter for us to, to map out and understand in order to understand how groundwater moves in the basin. And uh, just like most of the North Bay region, Sonoma Valley has some very complex uh, geology. We're located in a, in a region of, of, of lots of tectonic activity, which has caused deformation of many of the of the, the, the rocks and sediments in our basin. Uh, volcanic activity has occurred in our area. And over time, sea level has naturally fluctuated up and down, which has uh, caused um, uh, complicated patterns of, of, uh, of sedimentary layers in our basin. Fault lines are also a key feature of the basin, including the east side fault within the basin and the Bennett Valley and Rogers Creek faults, which are border or just outside the basin, but can influence the availability and quality of our groundwater by serving as boundaries for the sedimentary basins and by creating barriers or conduits for water flow. So um, having a good understanding of, of these geologic units is important. And uh, this next slide um, shows the relative ages of the uh, of the, the rocks and, and layers in our basin. 
Um, this is a legend for the geologic map on the previous slides. And the oldest rocks, the Mesozoic basement rocks, Franciscan rocks, which are more than 66 million years old, uh, essentially serve as an impermeable bottom layer, um, which holds the other groundwater ba bearing layers. The Wachika formation, um, which is approximately three, to three and a half to four million years old, and found mainly in the hills along the southeastern part of the basin near the Carneros region, is also another important formation. Well yields in this formation are typically very low due, due to high clay content and uh, can be a, a problematic area for obtaining uh, sufficient supplies for, for, for water wells. The Glen Ellen Formation, which is characterized by, also characterized by clay-rich stream deposits that can range from a few feet to hundreds of feet in depth, uh, can be found near the surface in the northern part of the basin and have some uh, pretty high variability in terms of the amount of groundwater that can be produced. The youngest uh, de deposits or, or sedimentary layers in the basin are the quaternary alluvial deposits, which cover much of the flat valley floor. These are younger than 100,000 years and are usually found near streams and alluvial fans. The Sonoma Volcanics um, are one of the more important formations we have in our, in our basin and uh, range from about two and a half to eight million years old and are found uh, throughout the hills uh, that border the basin as well as underground um, beneath some of these, these other um, layer, sedimentary layers and, uh, and, and formations. Um, in some areas, they can be close to the ground surface, um, such as areas that are shown in um, the uh, purples and, and blues are, are areas where they're found shallow underground. And this map was generated based on um, review of uh, evaluation of, of well logs throughout the basin to understand at what depth we uh, typically reach the Sonoma Volcanics and shows that uh, the, the deeper areas are kind of in that El Verano area where their um, colors are, are more red and orange and uh, the shallowest areas being along primarily the margins of the basin and, and the northern part of the basin as you get closer to, to Glen Ellen. So for the purposes of, of our plan, uh, we have broken out the basin into kind of a shallow and deep portions, um, shallow and deep aquifer systems. And these uh, will serve as our principal aquifer systems for the purposes of implementing uh, a sigma in our basin. And uh, the definition was essentially um, selected to uh, reflect the degree of surface water connectivity with the connectivity of surface water being much greater in the shallow aquifer. Uh, the degree of, uh, of confinement, that is to say the deeper aquifer is typically confined in many areas by, by clay layers that overlie it, as well as how those two different aquifers respond differently to hydraulic stresses like recharge and pumping with the shallow aquifer being typically more responsive to year-to-year to -year recharge, whereas the deeper aquifer can be more responsive to pumping stresses. Um, this, uh, this figure shows the, the shallow aquifer and uh, kind of the distribution of the different types of materials that are in, that are found in the shallow aquifer, with the uh, orangish squares being volcanic rocks, the um, yellow colors being a, a mixture of different materials and the uh, uh, purple and, and black circles being areas where we have uh, more sandy materials. Um, you can see some of the variability that we have in, in, in our basin. Um, the shallow aquifer system, it's present over the entire sub-basin. Uh, groundwater levels are generally pretty stable in this shallow aquifer system. In many areas, the shallow aquifer system is, is locally and seasonally connected to streams and surface waters. And uh, dating of the, of the water um, using stable isotopes has revealed that in most areas, a shallow aquifer has been recharged by waters that are, are younger than, than 50 years old. Um, the shallow aquifer is important. It supplies water to rural residents, some agriculture and municipal wells. 
as well as uh, providing water to streams that helps support uh, fish and, and, and plant life in our basin. The deep aquifer generally begins um, beneath 400 feet um, in general throughout the basin. Um, it's beneath the shallow aquifer system as well as a, a clay aquitard that separates the shallow and deep aquifer system in many places. Uh, the thickness of the individual individual permeable zones within the deep aquifer system is, is pretty variable and can range from several feet to hundreds of feet in thickness. And with that, uh, well productivity typically varies greatly in the deep aquifer as well, depending on the geologic formation and the amount of, of permeable materials that are encountered by the wells. Water in the deep aquifer is, is much older typically than the shallow aquifer and can be as old as uh, several thousand years, uh, seven th several thousand years old to over 50,000 years old in, in some uh, deep wells. And the deep, deep aquifer supplies water to water systems that supply rural residents, agriculture, businesses, as well as municipal water suppliers. So looking into how um, groundwater gets into the ground, um, mostly uh, recharge occurs from infiltration from rain and streams. Other sources can include leaking pipes, over irrigation and septic tanks. Most of this recharge goes directly into the shallow aquifer and the deep aquifer is recharged, is thought to be recharged through a combination of uh, leakage from the shallow aquifer, as well as mountain front recharge near the margins of the boundary. And this map shows uh, spatially throughout the basin um, where, what the primary um, recharge mechanisms are for different areas of the basin and, and how rapidly recharge occurs in those different areas. Uh, groundwater also leaves our, our aquifer system um, or is discharged from the system. Um, where groundwater resur resurfaces in the basin, uh, this is known as groundwater discharge and occurs typically through creeks, streams, seeps, interconnected wetlands, uh, deep-rooted plants that tap shallow aquifer, and at wells where it is brought to the surface from, by pumps. Groundwater can also be exchanged underground with uh, neighboring basins where they are connected. For example, groundwater generally flows uh, into the basin um, from the, uh, the Kenwood Basin to the north. Uh, so there's a, a natural connection with uh, nearby basins. And our groundwater aquifers within the basin, um, within the subbasin, are also connected with those um, aquifers that are in the volcanic rocks that border the basin. So there's also a natural connection uh, that the GSA needs to understand and uh, incorporate into the, the GSP that we'll be preparing for the, for the, uh, the, the Sonoma Valley subbasin. So now that we kind of have a basic understanding of the geology, soils, faults, and other characteristics of the basin, we're going to address the question of what is happening with our groundwater levels. Are they increasing, decreasing, staying about the same? Uh, those monitoring wells we discussed earlier provide information about both short-term and long-term trends in groundwater levels. However, because of the geologic complexity of our basin and the variability of the monitoring wells themselves, the trends should necessarily be used to interpret what's happening uh, specifically in your neighborhood. So these next uh, couple of maps show uh, trends in, in groundwater levels within the Sonoma Valley Basin um, that have been prepared um, to look at trends over the past uh, 10 years. And uh, this map shows trends for the, the shallow aquifer system. Um, groundwater levels will fluctuate seasonally and when we have uh, uh, as well as when we have droughts and heavy rainfall, which is normal. Um, Sigma requires us to look at whether groundwater levels are declining over, over time, by how much, and whether those changes are due to, to groundwater pumping. Um, nearly all plots of uh, groundwater level changes over time, known as hydrographs, indicate that long-term in the shallow aquifer, trends are relatively stable 
with the exception of being primarily some wells in the uh, El Verano area. Uh, this map, which shows trends uh, for the most recent 10 years, do show um, some additional declining trends likely due in part to the, the lower precipitation we've had in the last 10 years. Um, you can see the, the darker colored um, dots, the more redder colored dots that are larger are wells that have a higher rate of decline. So the dark red colored wells have uh, groundwater levels that are declining uh, at more than three feet per year. Whereas the white colored um, uh, dots, for example, show groundwater levels that, that are not changing, that haven't changed very much over that last 10 year period. So moving on to the, the deep aquifer system, um, we see a, a kind of a different story where we have a lot more um, declining trends, a lot more uh, points that have the uh, reddish color and, and orangish color um, declines that, that are exceeding two to, to three feet are much more commonly observed in, in the, uh, the deeper aquifer system, particularly in, in two areas of, of the basin. The most pronounced long-term declines are in the kind of the El Verano, Fowler Creek area, as well as southeast of the, uh, of the city of Sonoma and are located within or near areas where groundwater levels have locally declined below sea level. Most of the groundwater level declines are considered likely to have resulted from increases in, uh, in groundwater pumping. Uh, less rainfall over the last few decades has also contributed to groundwater level declines, but to a smaller degree. In the vicinity of the groundwater level pumping depressions located in the, those, uh, those two areas, uh, groundwater demands are primarily a combination of, of agriculture and rural domestic pumping. Uh, these two areas of decline have persisted for the last decade or more and, uh, and may be expanding. So groundwater levels are, are one area that, that will be of, of large focus in, in the GSP. Uh, another area is uh, land surface subsidence and uh, this is a photo taken in California's Central Valley where land surface subsidence is a, is a pretty major problem um, where they've had, I think, over 20 feet of subsidence in some areas. Um, this map shows more recent subsidence that has affected some infrastructure uh, down in the areas that's due to groundwater pumping. Fortunately, in Sonoma Valley, we don't see any uh, dramatic effects like uh, they're observing in the in the Central Valley, um, the data we have available um, doesn't indicate any um, historical subsidence due to groundwater pumping of, of anything close to those uh, uh, those those values. We do see some minor uh, moving of the ground surface um, uh, year to year with changes in climate. That's something that that's very common and is. Uh, and we'll get to later, this is one component that we will be, that we are currently um, looking at much more closely in developing uh, thresholds for, for making sure that we don't experience land surface subsidence into the future. So another um, area we need to focus on in this GSP is groundwater quality. And uh, in our basin, groundwater quality is generally acceptable, but there are certainly areas where there are some localized issues with, uh, with certain um, components such as uh, arsenic can be a problem in some areas, elevated boron can, can cause problems for, for irrigation with plants. Um, the, uh, the age of groundwater can also affect its quality. And uh, we've had studies done by the US Geological Survey, uh, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory that have determined that the age of groundwater and whether it's being recharged by modern water. The data suggested in general water from the deeper aquifer system is, is pre-modern and it was recharged prior to 1952 and water from the shallow aquifer system contains uh, some components of more modern uh, groundwater. Uh, in some local areas of the basin um, with a uh, constituents concern that pose challenges uh, 
including both arsenic and boron. Um, some of these areas are located along fault zones. This is an area where we commonly find some some challenges with uh, with water quality. Um, we have thermal um, groundwaters in, in our basin, which also can can pose problems with uh, with water quality. Um, other naturally occurring constituents of concern include chloride and, and total dissolved solids, which refer to the amount of mineral salts and other elements in the water. Um, some wells in the Carneros area and east of the east side fault have uh, higher levels of chloride. Um, a lot of that is related to those older, uh, deeper um, formations that, that have uh, water that's, that's been mineralized over time. And uh, generally, wells that have higher levels of, of total dissolved solids are associated with uh, those older um, uh, waters. Um, some areas south of the uh, the Baylands area are influenced by natural brackish water as well as those those more mineralized ther thermal waters that I mentioned. Uh, the seawater um, freshwater interface is something that's also important to, to understand. This diagram shows a typical aquifer that's connected to the bay where there's always the potential for uh, seawater to move into a basin if it's if it's being over pumped. Uh, this is something that we need to get a better handle on in Sonoma Valley in terms of its monitoring. Um, the seawater freshwater interface in Sonoma Valley occurs somewhere in the, the tidal marshlands south of, of uh, Highway 121. We don't know the exact location of it due to data gaps, um, but historical sampling of, of wells um, south of 37 um, and more recent sampling in that area has shown higher concentrations of, uh, of chloride and, and dissolved solids that, that do indicate um, some seawater intrusion um, at the very southern margins of the basin, um, where most of the beneficial uses in the basin occur, which is you know, north of, of Highway 121. Uh, we don't see any evidence of, of increasing chloride trends in, in wells. Um, based on our available data sets, but that is something that um, we are working on developing uh, monitoring, proposed monitoring to, to better, better map and, and understand that connection. Uh, additional uh, data collection and monitoring in these areas will better inform those current conditions and provide future monitoring of this potential risk. So another thing that the GSP will need to address is uh, the connection between surface water and, uh, and groundwater. Um, groundwater um, provides water to creeks and in some places the creeks provide recharge to, uh, to groundwater. In Sonoma Valley, a lot of work has been done by uh, Sonoma Water and, and the GSA in partnership with uh, Sonoma Ecology Center, as well as the, the USGS to determine the relationship between Sonoma Creek and the groundwater basin. The data suggests that the entire main stem of Sonoma Creek is uh, connected at least at times um, to the, the shallow aquifer system. Depending on the time of year, the amount of rainfall and groundwater pumping, uh, creeks can contribute water to the basin or the basin can contribute water to stream flow. Generally north of Glen Ellen, Sonoma Creek receives water from groundwater. As we go downstream, depending on the time of the year, the creek sometimes receives water from groundwater and sometimes becomes disconnected from groundwater flows. So this information is gonna help us with some current mapping we're doing on, on uh, groundwater dependent ecosystems within the basin. These are habitats and species that, that occur naturally within the basin that rely on groundwater, um, whether it's uh, riparian um, areas that, that uh, are relying on that groundwater, cool groundwater discharging into our creeks or uh, vegetation that have roots that, that tap into shallow aquifer systems. Um, the regulations related to, to Sigma require us to map out and uh, consider those groundwater dependent ecosystems as we develop our plan. So we have a, a, a practitioner's work group that has just formed um, with experts in, in 
ecosystem, local ecosystems and habitats and, uh, and groundwater that are currently meeting to develop uh, drafts of those maps that'll go through the uh, advisory committee and ultimately the, the GSA board. Uh, the final piece of section three is essentially our groundwater checkbook, um, which is uh, still in production. We, we are planning to, to bring information to the advisory committee on, on the groundwater budget at their meeting in September. And you can kind of think of this as a checkbook for for our groundwater budget, which tells us how much groundwater is coming into the basin annually and how much groundwater is, is going out of the basin. Uh, to help complete these sections, um, we also have some working groups that have been formed um, that are uh, helping estimate future demands um, that'll be part of our future water budget that, uh, that needs to be included in the plan. The uh, GSP is, is required to develop a, a water budget looking out 50 years into the future. And so these work groups are helping us uh, develop estimates for future agricultural demands, as well as potential future uh, rural residential uh, demands in the basin. So in summary, um, Sonoma Valley Basin is characterized by uh, many groundwater wells outside of urban areas that support uh, residents, farming and businesses, uh, a Mediterranean climate that's dependent on a few large storms, um, high degree of geologic complexity, resulting in a highly variable um, groundwater availability throughout the basin, a, a shallow and deep aquifer system that, that have some important um, distinct characteristics, um, two areas that have exhibited um, long-term groundwater level declines, primarily in that those deeper aquifer system, uh, no evidence of any um, historical permanent land surface subsidence, uh, relatively limited um, basin-wide water quality issues, and uh, a major waterway, Sonoma Creek, as well as some of its tributaries that are um, reliant on, on those groundwater flows. So with that, I think I'll turn it back over to Tim. All right, uh, thank you, Marcus. Excellent presentation. Do we have um, any questions? I don't see any in the chat and I don't see any hands raised quite yet. So just uh, it's open for questions if you have them, uh, you know, uh, happy to hear. Or if you, um, if you don't, that's okay too. And we can uh, move on to the uh, next presentation. And we can always handle a few questions on both uh, presentations at the end there. Okay, it's a pretty... Uh, Tim, we have a couple questions in the chat. Oh, okay, um, very good, thank you. Yeah. How reversible are the declines in the deep aquifer, uh, Marcus? So th those are, uh, th that's a very good question. And th those are questions that uh, we will be uh, addressing over the over the coming months. Um, I didn't really get into it with this presentation, but we have a, a computer model that's been developed that takes in um, all of the, the geologic information I presented, as well as uh, historical groundwater data um, for, for calibrating it that um, is gonna serve a really as a useful tool for us um, not only in preparing the, the water budget that I, I was uh, alluding to, but also um, to help us assess different types of, uh, of projects and actions, whether it's um, conservation, uh, recharge projects that can, you know, put in excess um, surface water when it's available into the, the groundwater basin. Uh, the model will be a, a tool that'll help us analyze it how different types of projects, what mix of projects might be uh, most suited for reversing um, those, uh, those declining trends. Um, we do have, um, you know, kind of a, a little bit of a corollary in a, in the, a basin uh, next door in the Santa Rosa Plain. Uh, historically, there were groundwater level declines 
of a similar magnitude that we're seeing currently in Southern Sonoma Valley, uh, you know, of uh, declines that went on, extended to about 100 feet or more over a period of, of a few decades. Um, those declines in that basin have been addressed, um, at least in part, by um, decreasing the amount of, of groundwater pumping by some cities, uh, Rona Park and Katadi in that basin, and the utilization of more imported um, Russian river water, recycled water, as well as conservation. And what we're seeing is, is groundwater levels have recovered to um, conditions that were close to the levels before the declines over the course of about 10 to 15 years. So it does take some time, but the deeper groundwater aquifers oftentimes can recover fairly quickly because they are under pressure. Um, okay, and uh, we thank you, Marcus. We've got another question. How is groundwater going to be regulated legally and financially? That's another very good question. Um, so the, the, the regulations are um, established by the, the, the state of California um, Department of Water Resources. And there's a, a, a framework for how these local GSAs need to comply with those statewide regulations. Um, and uh, there is a lot of um, uh, the, the locals definitely have a lot in terms of uh, decision making uh, locally on how to uh, how to regulate their basins individually as long as they comply with those statewide requirements. And so there are, um, uh, you know, certain um, authorities that are conveyed to groundwater sustainability agencies in terms of their ability to do projects and actions as well as, as um, limit pumping, um, if that's something that they choose to do. So the, what the regulations will look like lo locally are something that will be um, uh, considered by the GSA as it develops its groundwater sustainability plan. Um, it'll need to determine, you know, what if any types of regulations will be needed to implement that plan as well as kind of you know, needing to be adaptable over time. Um, so it's something that, that will be determined, at least initially over the next uh, year and a half as this plan is developed, but will be an ongoing, um, uh, you know, conversation and, and decision-making uh, part of the GSA's work going forward. Um, financially, um, you know, we've been fortunate to obtain a number of grants that have helped um, uh, defray a lot of the costs um, related to the development of the GSP um, go, uh, going forward. Um, but there will likely need to be, you know, some sort of, um, of funding mechanism um, in the future um, to implement the GSP. Um, the uh, uh, Santa Rosa Plain Basin has done a, a rate and fee study and has a structure that they set up initially in that basin. And that's something that, that this GSA would likely look, look at in the future as well. Thanks, Marcus. Uh, so it's gonna be in the plan, really, how that gets uh, worked out, just to kind of summarize. I see a couple of other uh, questions that have popped up. I'll try to help navigate this uh, with you. Um, I, there's a request to have a road overlay of the basin maps so those that are living at the edges can try to recognize actually where they are in relation to the valley and I assume the sub-basin boundary. So um, I'm, I guess uh, that's, a, that's a request, as I think, as much as it is a question, a request to have something posted perhaps on the website that, uh, that people could look at. Um, Tim, I was just going to chime in. This is Anne Dubay. If we go, if you go to the Sonoma Valley Groundwater.org website, um, you can enter your address into 
uh, a little finder there. It says find your basin. You click on it and it takes you to the Department of Water Resources website. And you can enter your address in there and um, your location will pop up on a map that shows whether you're in or out of the basin. So that's a really helpful tool. But we will, um, in the larger images of these maps, it's a little easier to see the major roadways. Okay, well, we've got quite a few questions, so we'll try to work through these relatively quickly. Uh, another question is, how important is it that residents conserve water in their landscapes in terms of maintaining the aquifers? Yeah, conservation can, can, can be a really um, important tool for us uh, uh, going forward. I think there's already been a lot of progress made and, and there's a lot of incentive-based tools in, in the urban areas that, that can be learned from. And, uh, and you know, hopefully, um, you know, rolled out to, to more of the well users in the basin, which are often uh, rural residential and, and, and agricultural users. So I think it can be an important part. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, kind of the assessment we'll be doing of what types of projects and actions will be needed will certainly include, um, you know, conservation programs. Great. Uh, yeah, the messages, I think, uh, uh, just if I could add to that, uh, everybody can do their part and everybody should do their part in terms of uh, conservation. It's uh, one big basin and everybody's got a piece. Uh, so here's another one. Will big viticulture agriculture in this basin influence the decisions of the GSA to the detriment of other? How do we ensure this process is not subject to lobbying and financial contributions to elected officials? Uh, I'm not sure if uh, you want to take that one on, Marcus. Well, uh, the uh, you know the GSA board meetings are are they're open to the public, um, just like any um, you know public uh, public agency is subject to uh, you know all the um, requirements you know, related to um, those types of, of decision makers. Um, this is Anne, if I could chime in. Um, we're, we're super lucky in this basin to have a long history of stakeholder-based um, decision making. And so we use that model um, to create the advise, an advisory committee that's comprised of stakeholder representatives. It includes agriculture, the environmental representatives, um, rural well owners, uh, businesses um, and just uh, the the general public um, and the member agencies that created the groundwater sustainability agency. So those stakeholders are um, all working together to provide recommendations to the GSA board, which, as Marcus said, is comprised of elected officials, including um, Susan Gorin, our chair. That's right. And this is a, a very good model in the state, if I could add, as a facilitator and a, and a groundwater management um, person who's worked in the state. And um, the, way to, the way to keep balance is, is be involved, stay involved uh, and say your piece, I would say, just to add to that. Uh, we've got one other question maybe, um, uh, and then we should move on. To, there's been modeling on vineyards using actual data, developing a water budget for grape growing. How does this information work its way into the larger water budget model, Marcus? Yeah, so the amount of, uh, of, you know, groundwater that's used, um, you know, outside of those urban areas. So most municipal wells in the basin, all municipal wells and, and public water supply wells are required to be uh, metered. Um, and uh, the usage is, is typically reported to the state through, through another um, program that we're able to, to utilize and access. But for rural residential and agriculture, we, we do not have um, you know, reported pumping that, that's been made available to us. Um, so we do need to rely on, on, on models and estimates to come up with uh, the amount of, of groundwater pumping from those, um, those more typically unincorporated uh, area users. And, uh, and we welcome any, any um, additional information, whether it's um, actual reported measurements um, from uh, from wells on, you know, 
including vineyards or um, any modeling that's been done. And uh, uh, we would definitely welcome any of that to help us, you know, better constrain our estimates that, that will go into the water budget. So we look forward to, to coordinating with any, any stakeholders that have information on, uh, on water usage that they can share. Great, thank you, uh, Marcus. So we should uh, probably move on. Uh, 